Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to PEM's 2020 budget update, which for the first time is being delivered as a webinar. Given the ongoing concerns surrounding the coronavirus, we've reluctantly had to cancel our live event, but we are very pleased that you're able to join our webinar. Our last update was way back in the autumn of 2018, and quite a lot has happened since then. Brexit has been delivered, now just a small matter of 10 years of trade negotiations ahead. We have a new PM and a very new Chancellor, who I have to say delivered a polished budget this week. On the morning of the budget, the Bank of England gave a strong signal of intent by reducing base rates to a paltry 0.25% to try and support the economy in the face of the global pandemic. But what did the Chancellor have to say? Well, his was a budget that had two main priorities. The first and most pressing was providing a multi-billion pound stimulus package to combat the virus challenge and the threat of a recession to the UK economy. The second priority was massive spending pledges and it was reminiscent of a Labour budget, tax and spend, but without the tax. Perhaps this is a brave new world where a Conservative government will spend like it's going out of fashion, deliver enough infrastructure projects just in time for the next election. How they're going to be paid for isn't clear. Not through tax rises, it seems, at least in the short term. So that leaves borrowing, which has been estimated at a huge 175 billion to fund public services and significant infrastructure projects. Now, there were some local highlights in the budget. Increased R&D expenditure credit, which has risen from 12 to 13 percent. More on this later. Increased investment in science, innovation and technology to 22 billion by 24-25. And a 300 million pound mathematical research fund to attract the best global talent over the next five years. There was also a commitment to significant infrastructure projects including funding for the new Cambridge South Station, improvements to the A428 and the A10 between Ely and Cambridge, and possibly a new town near Cambridge. So let's crack on. I'm delighted to be joined by Derek Carr, Sancha Norris, and Michael Godfrey, who's kindly stepped in for Jan Fasho, our business tax partner. The three of them will be guiding you through the delights of corporate tax, employee and property tax, VAT, and personal tax. If you have any questions following the webinar, please do get in touch with any of us or your usual PEM contact, and we'd be delighted to have that. Derek, over to you to lead us off. Thank you, Warren. Um, yeah, welcome again to our 2020 budget. Um, 2018, we had two, but last year the Chancellor forgot to fit one in as it's probably more important to prorogue Parliament and call an election. We were expecting a lot of content in this budget after Boris's resounding election victory gave him the majority most PMs dream about. Uh, but in this session this morning, I'm going to do a bit of scene setting before covering my topics of employment changes, property matters, and some of the tax avoidance changes in the budget. Um, but Rishi Shunak, um, some called him the least prepared chancellor of all time, and Sajid Javid is probably the unluckiest chance of all time. He announced two budgets and didn't deliver one because he wasn't prepared to be a Chino. And that's a chancellor in name only. Rishi Sunak was more than happy to be a Chino. So he was appointed a last minute substitute on the 13th of February. He's basically had four weeks to cram for this budget, but luckily Dominic Cummings helped him with some of the hard parts and Pretty Patel gave him a good talking to. Um, if he doesn't, if, as long as he does what he's told, I'm sure he'll come back to deliver the second 2020 budget plan for the autumn. And as it's Cheltenham week, you probably would bet on that as well. So yes, don't panic. Rishi's got it all under control. Um, and some of the announcements, they weren't big surprises. Um, they've been leaked already and Boris was still giving away some of those secrets in the Prime Minister's question time immediately before Rishi stood up, stood up to deliver his budget. Uh, we knew there'd be lots of cash for the NHS. And luckily the service was just getting back off its knees before this pandemic hit. Uh, and we all remember Boris's first cabinet meeting with chance of 40 new hospitals, 50,000 nurses, 50 million more GP appointments. So as long as you believe him, we're all fine. Um, and help for businesses and the self-employed affected by the pandemic wasn't on the list until a week ago. And would he really abolish entrepreneurs relief? All of these things were in the mix. Higher rate pension tax relief was supposedly under threat. Uh, it sounded reasonable when the stock market was booming, um, but it probably looked a bit reckless at the start of this week when markets were in free fall. There was also talk about taxing some of the US tech giants that was mentioned, but would we really go there if we wanted to do a tremendous deal with Donald Trump? And climate wise, uh, we still remember the floods 
and flood defence measures, environmental tax changes, promoting ultra low emission cars. They were always on the cards. And this Sunday was International Women's Day, so the abolition of the tampon tax wouldn't have been a huge surprise, and it wasn't a surprise in the end anyway. So it's only 18 months, as Warren said, since Philip Hammond was preparing for a bright new future. But like Theresa May, he's just a memory of the good old days when we only have Brexit to worry about. Uh, we seriously thought Brexit might cause a slowdown in the UK economy, but I think it's going to be completely small beer compared to COVID-19. Now it's officially a pandemic. But this was definitely a budget of two halves. I can imagine a parallel universe. Uh, Sajid Javid was just given the second part of the budget as a one nation conservative budget, full of hope about Boris's new dawn, where pluck and nerve was all we needed to succeed. But in the real world, Rishi needed to get it done against a backdrop of COVID-19, countries in lockdown, oil price crashes and Black Monday. And at the same time, deliver on those election promises, levelling up across the country to rebalance wealth, pay off to the Labour voters up north, uh, prepare for Brexit trade negotiations, rebuilding British infrastructure, and of course, more police, hospitals, nurses and GP appointments. But turning to more mundane things, the employment tax changes, where there was, luckily, some much needed help for employers. Basically, we're all going to be taking some time off work in the next few weeks. So help for SSP costs was something that was a, a nice surprise in the budget. There's going to be limited to two weeks per employee. Normally, this cost is picked up by the employer, but the government are going to refund this. But as long as you are you know, a, a business with less than 250 employees, you'll be eligible. And that 250 number will be determined by the number of employees you had at 28th of February 2020. And you'll be able to reclaim the expenditure as long as... Uh, the employee who claimed the SSP was actually affected by COVID-19. So that's what that's one of the other conditions. Um, the employment allowance, this has been gradually creeping up in, and this April it'll be going from 3,000 to 4,000 pounds. It's gonna reduce the cost of employment uh, by reducing you know, the effective cost of taking on new people. And an average gain of 850 pounds per year to most businesses. And there will be 65,000 businesses completely out of paying national insurance. Uh, and as I say, it's something which the government have been focusing on, trying to get more people into work. There's going to be a review of the EMI scheme, basically leaving the EU has uh, cut us away from the state aid rules. And we can now review the EMI scheme to ensure that it does provide a measure of support for high growth companies so we can recruit and retain the best talent. And uh, Sanchez will be covering the entrepreneurs relief changes. But I can just give you a slight highlight. It's not going to affect most option holders who get their options through the EMI scheme. The government's going to extend the scope of non-taxable counselling services. So if as a result of having you know, sort of tax-free counselling through your employer, you're uh, able to get medical treatment such as cognitive behaviour therapy, that will also be tax-free as part, as long as it's part of the, wel the welfare counselling package. And those changes will come into effect this April 2020. Uh, the flat rate income tax deduction, uh, this sounds like a very small change uh, of going up from £4 per week to £6 a week. You can claim tax relief on the additional household costs, but I think in April a lot of us will be working from home, so it'll be something we may be looking at in a bit more detail. Company cars and vans, um, again, the move towards environmental changes and, and greener uh, travel. Is, is part of the, the, the Chancellor's policy. And from April 2020, there'll be nil benefit in kind from electric, chair, electric cars. Um, there's going to be a 2% reduction for low emission cars, newly registered after that date. And the fuel benefit, this is where the, it does hit that, uh, it's going to increase with the Consumer Prices Index. So that keeps going up and up. Uh, and from April 2021, in that relation to vans, there's going to be a nil rate of tax for zero emission vans, which is good news. The big change, which I think no one expected, was the rate use of red diesel. Uh, basically, um, they're going to remove the entitlement to use red diesel. It was seen as a, as a basic a state subsidy for pollution, um, but it will be allowed to continue for agriculture sector. That's horticulture, fishing and forestry uh, and other areas as well. But if you were using red diesel before, a lot of people won't be able to use it from April 2022. And when we're all on the electric chair, electric cars, I keep saying electric chairs, but electric cars, um, it would be great, good to see all these rapid charging hubs. The government are putting 500 million into setting these rapid charging hubs around the country. One thing which we knew was coming into force on the 6th of April was the off-payroll working, hitting the private sector. Um, the new rules are going to affect large and medium-sized organisations, and I can't believe you don't know who you are now. 
uh, you should really look into this. But basically, if you're engaging personal service companies, instead of paying them on their invoices, you've got to pay them via the payroll. Um, there was a lot, a lot of backlash about this, which meant that the HMRC has softened its stance. Um, but I think the extra PAY and national insurance that the government are looking to receive from these changes are going to be very important going forward. So the only change that the Chancellor has looked at is a light touch with regard to penalties and saying there'll be no retrospective challenges unless, of course, there was fraud involved. Um, and there will be a six month review taken just to see the impact on the labour market as well. Turning to property, um, there were quite a number of property matters, including the budget, and again, some help for businesses, especially in relation to business rates. So if you're in the retail sector, you run a pub or you run a local newspaper, then you should look into the detail. There will be some relief in relation to your business rates. And perhaps the most fundamental uh, announcement was the actual review of the whole business rate system. Um, basically, this is going to be uh, reporting in the autumn. And I say it is, some, it is a time that this old fashioned system is, is basically overhauled and changed. So it'd be good to see what comes out of that review. There's going to be a special SLD, SDLT charge. Uh, this is, comes in April 2021. We haven't got all the details of this, but basically it's going to be a 2% additional surcharge on UK residential property if it's been purchased by non-resident purchasers. So if you've been in the UK for less than 183 days, you're going to be non-resident. So you should pay an extra 2% when you buy UK residential property. Uh, there's going to be complex rules for different classes of purchase if you're a company a partnership or an individual uh, but we haven't seen the detail but it's something to look out for if you are advising individuals who are coming to the uk to purchase property a few more changes uh, vat on the domestic reverse charge um, this was something that's an element of fraud was happening basically uh, people were charging vat for work that were done and never paying it over to, to hmrc they were just going missing so uh, basically, in this system now, which is going to come in place from 1st of October 2020, it's the customer that accounts for the VAT rather than the, 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 the supplier. So it's going to be something which obviously combat fraud and stop people absconding with VAT that should go into the government coffers. Um, glad to see there's some changes in these cladding on tower blocks. Uh, the government are putting a lot of money into this to get these unsafe cladding removed, finally. And there's going to be more affordable houses. A 12 billion settlement we put into that to encourage local authorities to start building. You know, we've had the 30 years since we were building council houses. Perhaps it's time for the cycle to restart and these housing programs to really take off. And also, how's that going to happen for developers? There's going to be a 21st century planning system uh, promised by the Chancellor. More news from the Housing Minister, but we'll see the detail when it arrives. Finally, on tax avoidance, and it's worth saying, since 2010, the government have protected over £200 billion pounds worth of tax that would otherwise have gone unpaid. And the changes announced by Rishi Sunak in the, the budget this week is going to tackle more forms of tax avoidance, evasion and non-compliance, which should raise another £4.7 billion between now and 24-25. And the way they're going to do that is by clamping down on abuse. Uh, there's a lot of illicit trade in tobacco. I can't see many people smoking, but unfortunately it looks like it's a problem for the UK economy. Uh, there's going to be a creation of a UK-wide HMRC intelligence sharing hub to really attack this problem. Similarly, in the construction industry, there are abuses going on where non-compliant businesses are using the CIS scheme to actually claim tax refunds they're not entitled to. So we're going to try and out of all that. It's areas of the hidden, hidden economy, the tax system is going to try and... Uh, get people back onto the books. So if you want to renew your license to drive a taxi or private hire vehicle or minicab, or if you want to deal in scrap metal, these businesses involve you applying for a license. And unless you can prove you're paying, playing by the rules and you're registered for tax, you won't get your license. So that's to drive people away from the hidden economy. And HMRC is getting more resources in terms of more compliance officers, new technology, and this investment should bring another 4.4 billion of tax revenue up to 24-25 by additional compliance and better debt collection. We're also looking to protect the tax system. Uh, the loan charge review is coming for a lot of criticism recently, um, but there's still people out there coming up with schemes to try and get around this charge. So there's going to be further action for those who promote and avoid uh, promote and market tax avoidance schemes. So we're going to tackle the promoters. Uh, to be honest, PEM see very little in terms of tax avoidance schemes these days. If anyone was coming to come here, we just wouldn't let them near our clients. It's just bad news completely. But HMRC have got a promoter strategy. So anyone 
who's enabling abusive schemes, basically they could face penalties for 100% of the fees they charge, which want to stop promoters from marketing and selling avoidance schemes. And there's going to be technical amendments to prevent spurious legal challenges coming in relation to things like the loan charge review. And finally, if, if you're looking to get out of paying your tax by going insolvent, uh, if you've been collecting taxes, be that VAT, PAYE, employers' national insurance or construction industry scheme deductions, those won't go to pay your creditors. They will have to get paid over to the government, paid over to HMRC, because they rightly belong to the government. Um, and that's all I've got to say. So on the Centre Business Taxes, I'm going to pass you over to Mike Godfrey to take you through that session. So thank you, Derek. Now, while it was clear that the budget was looking to stabilise the nation in light of the coronavirus pandemic, there are still things in there for businesses to take note of. Unsurprisingly, we knew a lot of what was coming, but there was also a little that we didn't. And in this section of the presentation, I will look at the main points that will impact businesses in our region and beyond. So first things first, the reduction of the corporation tax rate. As promised, the Chancellor has reversed the reduction of the CT rate to 17%, which was to be enacted from April 2020. So it now remains at 19%. This is still the lowest main rate of tax in the G10 to 20. We knew it was coming, but this budget does confirm it, and it's going to go some way to help Boris find the missing millions for the NHS. R&D. So there was a lot of talk from the Chancellor about the government promoting innovation across all sectors, especially in medicine. He wants the UK to invest in ideas. As Warren said earlier, he wants to increase investment in this area dramatically through funding for R&D. There's 22 billion promised in total and specific amounts available for universities nationwide. R&D and innovation is always a big area of interest for us at PEM. In and around Cambridge, there are plenty of companies that are undertaking R&D in all areas, um, but there's only been minor changes to the R&D regime uh, through this budget. The first and probably the biggest change is the increase in the R debt from 12 to 13%. This is actually probably quite important given that there's going to be an increase in funding given by the government. As companies that receive funding, whether it's from state aid or other grants, are usually caught within the RDEC regime. So this will give a benefit to them if they're getting increased funding. A couple of other smaller changes that are mentioned. Firstly, the PYE cap on the SME scheme. So this was seen as an anti-avoidance measure, um, but HMRC is still consulting on it because they think that it ultimately at the moment, it's targeted so that it's not going to probably get the right result they're looking for. So HMRC are postponing this for a further year to take further consultation to make sure that it actually captures the people they're trying to catch through anti-abuse and anti-avoidance. There's also consultation on cloud computing under the SME scheme and RDIC scheme for qualifying costs and whether it should be included at all. Currently, a lot of businesses use cloud computing, things like Amazon Web Services, etc., that really can be a powerful tool for them and a cost-effective tool for undertaking R&D work. But currently, those costs are not covered um, by the existing qualified cost regime. It'll be interesting to see how this consultation progresses and exactly where uh, this cost will go within the R&D regimes. Capital allowances provide tax relief for qualifying capital spend, and they're typically an area where the Chancellor can make big headline-grabbing promises that may only impact minority businesses. The example we've got at the moment is the current annual investment allowance, which was £1 million. So that's been a £1 million since the 1st of January 2019 and will continue up till 31st December 2020. Within this budget, there's been no mention of a change to the AIA, but obviously we've got a potential autumn budget on the horizon where things could change again and Rishi may look to increase, decrease or leave it as it's planned to be going down to £200,000 from 2021. Another change we were expecting was the increase in the flat rate structure and building allowance from 2% to 3% per annum. This is a relatively new tax relief. It's been in place since 29th of October 2018 for new building contracts entered into on or after that date. Effectively, you're going to get relief for the bricks and mortar costs now of the business. And increasing this to 3% is reducing that from 50 years relief to a 33 and a third year relief. A slightly odd number, but it's what they've gone with. It was made clear in the budget that on top of everything else that we've got going on at the moment, reducing carbon emissions, getting to net zero, et cetera, is still a target for the government. And a way they can help with this and encourage it is through capital allowances. Obviously, the budget in 2018, it was mentioned that capital allowances on 
environmentally friendly plant machinery, so enhanced capital houses, would come to an end from April 2020. That's still the case, and while it's a shame that this beneficial allowance is going, it's unsurprising. There was little take up, it was overly complicated, people just weren't interested when we talked to it, it was hard to get the buy in. A more successful area for environmentally friendly tax release is for vehicles, and in particular cars. And Derek's obviously already mentioned on the employment side of things how the benefits are changing for, for zero emissions cars. Um, tax relief through companies is changing as well. So cars that are now zero emissions will get 100% first year allowance, whereas previously that was cars with emissions from zero to 50 grams per kilometer. So this kind of gets rid of all hybrid cars from that 100% first year allowance bracket. Low emission cars are now those from zero to 50 grams per kilometer CO2, and you'll get 18% writing down allowance on those. Anything above 50 grams is 6% writing down allowance a year. It's clear that the government wants you to buy vehicles that are environmentally friendly, that are zero emission electric cars. So that is the way to go for businesses for tax relief. One area that cropped up that we didn't really see coming was on intangibles. So while it seems like a small change, the intangible asset regime has been really complicated over the years and made more so in recent years. The impact of the proposed changes from 1st July 2020 will be to effectively say that the two regimes we have now are merged into one. All the intangible fixed assets that the company acquires or creates after 1st July 2020 will be treated as if they're a new intangible. This means you'll get tax relief as and when you write those other write those assets down um, through amortization. The main impact of this is through related party acquisitions which may come up around as a result of reconstructions um, or just transactions between connected companies. Previously, these assets, doesn't matter when you purchase them, these assets were still treated as if they were pre-2002 assets, if that was when they're created. What this now means is that you can undertake a connected party transaction and potentially get tax relief on the acquisition of that asset. As I said, it's very complex. There are going to be several transitional and anti-avoidance clauses put in, and we haven't yet seen the full legislation, which is potentially why this has been enacted from July 2020. Give them time to get it written correctly. So looking through some other measures that were announced, and these were ones that we knew were coming in with effect from April 2020. The first one is the corporate capital loss restriction. So in April 2017, restrictions were put in place for trading losses when they were in excess of £5 million. The same restriction has now been brought in for capital losses. Um, it's important to note that the £5 million limit is a combined loss limit. It's not £5 million for trade losses, £5 million for capital losses. It's a combined loss limit. Uh, so you need to be wary of that when looking at how you utilise losses. Another change that came in was to the non-resident land law regime. So non-resident land law companies were typically taxed under the income tax regime. But from April 2020, this is changing to being brought within the CT regime, effectively bringing them in line with corporate companies in the UK holding property. The main things you need to consider here is the fact that the rules will slightly change. You'll be looking at interest restriction, potentially hybrid mismatch, etc. within these regimes. You'll also need to think about the tax admin for the company. You'll now be brought within the CT regime, so your filing deadlines are 12 months after the year end of the company, tax payment deadline nine months and a day after the year end. And you'll be taxed at the CT rate, so 19% at the moment and not 20%. Hybrid mismatch consultation. So this is an ongoing consultation to ensure that the hybrid mismatch rules, which are rules to seek to treat any mismatch of tax treatment between two jurisdictions, are working as they're intended. So it's still ongoing and we'll see what comes out of this. Something we weren't quite expecting was the large business notification. Effectively now, XMRC are telling you to police yourself. You have to hold your hands up if you think you're going to do anything that HMRC won't like. Definition of a large business is likely to be that the same as those for a senior accounting officer, so businesses with over £200 million of turnover, £2 billion of balance sheet assets. The final change, digital services tax. So the government is still pushing forward with this tax, so it's a 2% tax on revenue for digital service providing companies, so the big companies like Google, Amazon, etc. is really trying to target. A lot of other countries have not pushed ahead with this and they're waiting for a global resolution to this, a global solution to come through. And there's one individual who is definitely not happy about the UK still putting this through, and that is the Donald. So moving on to VAT. 
Um, VAT and e-publications, we didn't necessarily know it was coming in, but it's very welcome. Effectively, the sale of printed matter, books, new papers, etc., has always been zero rated from day one. The sale of e-publications was standard rated. It's now been brought in line, so the 1st of December 2020, there is no VAT on reading. So you can download a new Kindle to your heart's content and not worry about VAT. Another change was just postponed accounting. So currently VAT is payable on imported goods from outside the EU, and then there is a recovery mechanism. But actually, this is this gives businesses an actual cash flow cost. The proposal from 1st of January 2021 is that subject to certain conditions, the VAT usually payable at importation will instead be accounted for by the VAT return in the period in which the goods are entered into free circulation. This doesn't just postpone the point in which tax has to be paid, but it also provides the potential to recover the same VAT as input tax. It's a simplification and a boost for business cash flow, so it's good news for businesses from a VAT front. VAT and partial exemption. For any businesses that deal with partial exemption, you know that it's complicated, it can be onerous and time consuming. There's been called for a long time for the rules to be simplified and consultation is ongoing. So the government is still liaising with stakeholders, but this is actually getting to quite a good stage now where hopefully we should have some resolution, some clear forward guidance, um, hopefully by the autumn budget, if not over the summer. So that's me now for uh, business tax. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague Sanchez Norris to take you through the impact of the budget on individuals. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, and a good morning to everybody. Um, this is Rishi Sunak's world of alliteration. Throughout his budget speech, he used a triad of tried and tested alliterative statements. We thought that we would try and emulate some of these in our presentation. After all, there is no higher form of flattery, and he did deliver a very polished budget. As we progress through the slides, if necessary, I will translate as necessary. But for a chancellor who had an extremely limited time in which to prepare his budget, this alliteration must have added a couple of hours. I know that from our own experience. So we're going to look today at a number of issues that affect individuals. The random rates roundup, looking at tax rates and thresholds. It is what it says on the tin, so we won't look at it in any detail. A number of issues have been introduced for administration of, and alteration and actions. The first point is making tax digital. We've been hearing about making tax digital for individuals and businesses for many years now. It was finally introduced for VAT and allegedly it might not be going very well. So before it is introduced for anybody else, the government are going to undertake a full evaluation of the experience the VAT practitioners have had. Whether we'll see it in the future, we do not know. It looks as though it's not very bright for B, for MTD. Some minor changes for LLP returns to bring them in line with everybody else um, allows the inland revenue to adjust member individual returns where they believe that the partnership is not operating with a view to making a profit. HMRC automation is bringing HMRC HMRC processes up to date. At the moment, an individual, a person, has to issue a tax return or a penalty for it to be upheld by the court. The changes allow automation and a computer to issue a notice. And finally, some breathing space for problem debts. Um, the government have given themselves some breathing space on this because there's very little information about it at the moment and it is not going to be introduced until early in 2021. The intention is that <clears throat> any business that has, or individual that has difficulty paying their debts to the Inland Revenue, they will bring in a debt advice service <clears throat> and they will uh, action a sustainable debt solution. Will they bring it in before the 2021 tax payments are due? Who knows? A breathing space for the government. One of the main points that Derek mentioned earlier, we were expecting changes to perfect pensions. Will the planning that they have given us be perfect for all individuals? Who knows? 
going forward, there are going to be winners and losers, and your personal circumstances are going to need to be looked at. Changes will apply from 6 of April 2020 to the contributions that high earners can, can pay into or accrue in their pension fund. So there is actually no limit to how much an individual can save or accrue in their pension fund, but there is an annual limit on the amount which is tax relieved. The standard maximum annual allowance is currently £40,000 and that is not going to change. In addition, if you have unused annual allowances, you can carry them forward from the previous three years and add them to the annual allowance in the current year, which achieves a new total for the year. So theoretically, if you wanted to and you had the earnings, you could pay a once-off payment of £160,000. But problems arise when the payments that you make or the accrual that occurs in your pension fund is greater than the total you are allowed and the excess is subject to an annual allowance charge. When this annual allowance charge comes in is governed by the level of earnings that you have yourself. So if you are a high earner, then the £40,000 allowance is actually tapered or reduced down to a lower amount and it is tapered on a one pound for every two pound of income over the income limit. This is causing all sorts of problems for the delivery of public services, particularly the NHS, as many of the doctors are high earners under this definition and their pension savings were causing additional tax charges or restrictions in the amount that they could actually contribute themselves. So from 6 of April 2020, individuals will be subject to a tapering of an annual allowance in the future if their income exceeds £240,000 rather than £150,000. However, to balance this, there is a reduction in the £10,000 allowance down to £4,000. And this means there are going to be winners and losers. So let's see what that means to you in practice. So looking at a winner, Dr John Smith, he has total earnings of £210,000. He every year makes a gross pension contribution of £40,000, so he has no unused allowance from the earlier years. So under the old rules, he has an annual allowance of £10,000 and he has got excess pension contributions of £30,000. He every year now has to pay an annual allowance charge, an extra tax of £13,500. As a doctor, he was very unhappy with this, as were many other individuals, and it was disincentivizing doctors from carrying out additional hours. So the government wanted to address that and brought in some new rules. Under the new rules, because his income is less than the new rate, he can pay his £40,000 and there'll be no excess and no annual allowance charge. However, his wife, who is also a very high earner, she has total earnings of £400,000 and she only pays the £10,000 she's ever been allowed to pay without incurring an additional tax charge. She has no allowances from earlier years. Her situation is very different. At the moment, she has no annual allowance charge. Under the new rules, because the annual allowance is reduced from ten to £4,000, she's going to have to pay £2,700 worth of extra tax. So she is a loser under these new rules. So each one of us is going to need to look at our circumstances and see how we are impacted by them. Exasperated entrepreneur exits. Derek mentioned we're expecting changes to entrepreneurs relief and indeed we have seen them. They're not quite as bad as we thought they might have been, but they are going to have very significant impact to what the government are saying is only a very small minority of individuals. ER halves the tax that is paid on a capital gain when an entrepreneur disposes of their business or shares that qualify. We won't go into those because we've looked at them in detail in the past, but from 11th of March, the limit of the gain which is taxed at 10% rather than 20% is going to be reduced to £1 million from £10 million. The effect of that is going to be dramatic. If the proceeds of your transaction now, or indeed in previous years, exceed a million pounds, then going forwards there will be no ER to reduce the tax that you're going to pay. So let's look at that in practice. 
we have an entrepreneur who is has just sold his business the gain on the business sale was 10 million pounds if the sale had occurred on the 10th of march 2020 the whole of the gain would have qualified for er at 10 percent if he sold on the 11th of march the first million pounds would be taxed at 10 percent and the balance taxed at 20. so the capital gains tax that will be payable on that disposal has increased from 1 million to 1.9 million pounds what a difference a day it makes so if the entrepreneur had taken his advisor's advice and he had advanced the sale from the 10th from the 11th of march to the 10th of march knowing that something was going to happen in the budget he would now be feeling rather smug i suspect particularly happy that he'd taken that advice but we have to look at it very, very carefully because we have some anti-forestalling provisions. And it is possible that these will apply from 6th of April 2019. So that means that a transaction that has happened in the past year, even before we knew there might be some changes to entrepreneurs' relief, could be impacted by this. The devil is in the detail but where planning has already been undertaken and you have artificially banked relief, perhaps via an unconditional contract or using a trust, then this anti-forstalling is likely to catch you and the 10 million cap will be reduced to one million pounds. In addition, if you have an interconnected trans transaction between connected parties, then you have to be able to show that that transfer is for wholly for commercial reasons. Otherwise, again, the one million cap is going to apply. So all planning for recent transactions needs to be reviewed as soon as possible. Once the full information is available, the legislation is there for us, we need to look at disposals that have been made since April 2019. If you have made a commercial transaction and it was not put in place to specifically to avoid or be affected by the changes that are being introduced, then you should be okay. But it is necessary to go back and look at those disposals from April 19. And certainly we looked at this and a couple of my clients, I know their hearts have gone cold at this, thinking that they may have an impact. Most of them will be absolutely fine. It has been a commercial decision that's driven their sale and they will still benefit from the 10 million pound cap. But from the 11th of March onwards, we need to revisit it. So if you've discussed with us in the past, your entrepreneur's relief, exit strategies, now is the time to relook at it. So it is worth remembering that a 10% rate is a very beneficial rate, but indeed, 20% isn't too shabby either, unless, of course, it's coming out of your pocket or mine. The budget seemed to be, on the surface, very silent on other far-reaching tax changes which were expected, but from a let's-get-it-done government, that doesn't mean to say it's not going to happen. So, as a recap, we have some fairly chaotic capital gains tax changes that are being introduced from 6th of April, and this affects the sales of UK residential property. If you are selling your main residence, the lettings relief, if you have let it out in the past, was very valuable at £40,000 per individual making the sale. That from 6th of April is only going to be granted if you shared occupation with your tenant at the time. That is very unusual circumstances and most individuals will now lose their lettings relief. In addition, if it's been your main residence, the principal residence relief, the final period is being reduced from nine, to nine months from 18. That's going to have very significant impacts on individuals' tax positions. In addition, we now have online returns that are due 30 days from completion. The disposal occurs on the date of exchange, not on the date of completion, but from 30 days of completion, if that occurred after 6th of April 2020, you now have to send an online tax return and you have to pay the tax that is due. That is very different experience from where we've been in the past. As a trap, the definition of residential property is wide and sometimes a bare piece of land could qualify. 
So again, let's have a quick look at how this could impact on you. Mr. and Mrs. James are selling their home. The gain is going to be £400,000. They've actually used it as their main residence for four years and they've let it for six. They're going to aim for a simultaneous exchange and completion. So on the date they exchange, it will be disposed. If the disposal happens prior to 5th of, including 5th of April, that game will be eligible for main residence relief for four years and 18 months. It will also be eligible for lettings relief of £80,000. So on the gain of £400,000, the capital gains tax that's payable is only £28,000 and that will not be due until the 31st of January 2021. If you contrast that with a disposal made on the 6th of April, one day later, exactly the same gain, the main residence relief is now restricted down to nine months for the last period of ownership. So once you take into account the fact they get no lettings relief either, the chargeable gain is much higher, as is the tax. So an additional £30,000 and £800 of tax, and that tax is going to be due on the 4th of May. So not only are you selling it one day later, you are reporting it and paying the tax very significantly earlier. So there's one message that I want you to take from that. If you are in the process of selling your main residence and you haven't occupied it for the last period and you have let it out and you're expecting lettings relief, go talk to your solicitors now and have the exchange on or before the 5th of April. So long as the exchange is not conditional, then you will get those additional reliefs. So as well as things that are coming in, we did have a number of points we expected to be brought in. And this is the get it done government. We expect that these will come in probably in the next budget in the autumn of this year. We have had OTS, Office of Tax Simplica Simplification Reviews of the IHT system. It suggested a radical change for inheritance tax. We have had consultations for trust rules and legislation. We haven't seen the results of those yet, but the consultation period is closed. We do expect that these are not going to be ignored and will probably be deferred. But now, assuming they're not going to bring in any other retrospective legislation in the future, this is an opportunity to use existing reliefs, exemptions and allowances that are available. Gifts out of excess income, making a gift which is not capital, so doesn't count for inheritance tax. These are all opportunities that exist for us right now and may not be there in the future. So I'd like to encourage everybody to think about in the next six months whether they can benefit from these. So as a summary, we've had a new chancellor who is, as he said himself, all for new job opportunities. Um, but COVID-19 is here officially, it's a pandemic and the prediction for the next few years is universal disruption. Actually, that should be weeks, next few weeks, universal disruption, don't want to cause absolute panic around the world. Does the government have a clear plan? They have just not shared it with us. Um, they're encountering delays to their plan, but they have a destination and I, accept, I suspect they will accept no diversions. If they haven't done it yet, they're likely to revisit it and it will be done in the future. The budget was an extravagant spending budget, the most extravagant for 25 years, but current circumstances drove that and it was necessarily. And I think the only person who has said anything negative about it at the moment is Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but this is going to deal with us in the current circumstance and deal with the new virus directly and indirectly. There's going to be significant investment in the country through the infrastructural growth and a move to support the innovators of our future. It has been a very political budget, but we are investing in ideas. It was crafted by experts um, who are experts in getting it done. And in this case, they like to think that it has been defined by us, the voters of the country. So hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion today and learned a little bit more about the details of the budget as it affects you. I thought as we are not meeting face to face, I would introduce you to our tax teams. Um, and they are available today on the telephone or by email. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us in the usual way.
we hope that you stay well over the next few weeks and we do look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully, at our budget in this coming autumn. Thank you very much.